Well, in the name of Jesus, amen. So last week, if you joined us, uh, Pastor Lee was using this corn cob to talk about spreading seed, how the seed is spread among the, among the world, how God's word is spread among the world. And he was using a sermon prop. And I'm going, if he gets a sermon prop, use a sermon prop, I want to use a sermon prop. So I brought my sermon prop, as if I've already mentioned it to you. This is my, my fishing pole that I've had since I was a kid. I've caught hundreds of fish on it, different varieties, different types. And I told Pastor Lee, I'm going to use a fishing pole. And my sermon, he goes, first thing he said right away, Can you, do you think you could cast down in the middle of the aisle without hooking anybody? And I said, probably not, but I'm willing to give it a try. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. But I did bring this because up front, quite honestly, fishing is our main theme today. And so I think it's okay because a lot of us know about fishing. I mean, even if you don't enjoy fishing, go out fishing yourself, you know somebody who does. But yeah, fishing is something that we all can relate to, I think. And um, I brought a couple of pictures of my kids, some of my favorite pictures of my kids that are fishing related. So here's the pictures of my kids. So this is my son. This was taken at Skyview Lake here in town last year. Last year, he comes up to me and goes, Dad, I want to go fishing. What father can say no to his son when he wants to go fishing? So we get out his little kid fishing pole, and I don't remember what, we, what, his, what his bait looked like, but we go out there, and I, think, I go out there going, he's never going to catch a fish. He's going to get bored with this in about 10 minutes, and I'm going to come home. Well, I was wrong, because he was more dedicated, more determined than I was. I was ready to go home. He wanted to catch a fish. He had never caught a fish before. He, all of a sudden, he goes, Dad, I think I got one. He reels it in, and he caught it. This is the littlest fish I've ever seen caught on a fishing hook. I mean, it is deep, but it was his very first fish, and he didn't care if it was little. He caught a fish. He wanted to catch a fish, and he caught a fish, and he was ecstatic over it. It's what he wanted to do. Keep that metaphor in mind as we go. The other picture is a picture of me and my daughter, and that is taken on the pier at Island View Lodge on Fisher Lake in Mercer, Wisconsin. And Mercer, Wisconsin, to me, is kind of what Long Pine is to Pastor Lee. It's kind of that family, idyllic vacation spot you keep going back to. And I say that because in the 1960s, I had a great uncle who bought the Island View Lodge on Fisher Lake and owned and operated it for many years, and it was where my great-grandfather used to take my dad fishing. And then when I was old enough, my dad took my brothers and I, and now I had a chance to take my daughter. So that's a very special picture to me. But it's interesting. I, I know all these stories about Island View Lodge that are not my stories. They've been told to me. One of my favorites was back in the 60s when my uncle owned the lodge. Um, he also thought he owned the lake, too. He didn't own the lake. He owned the lodge. But he thought he kind of owned the lake and managed the lake, too. And that lake has all the good, the good fish you want to catch, the walleyes, the bass, the pikes, the muskie but it also had yellow perch in it. And my uncle hated yellow perch. He dis detested this fish and he wanted to get the fish out of the lake. So back in the day, he offered bounties to the fishermen to get the yellow perch out of the lake. At the same time, it was also legal to own a handgun in the boat because it's the Northwoods, there's black bears. So you want to be ready. And if you catch a five-foot muskie that can bite your arm off, you want to get it before it gets you. So handguns, bounties on perch, little perch. You're perch about that big. As you can imagine, there was a lot of holes in the bottoms of the boats. <laughs> boats that had been rented from my great uncle. And I've even seen some of these boats where they got patches in the bottom. I mean, it, this really happened. We could tell a lot of fish stories. We could tell a lot of fish stories because fishing is something that we do pretty much recreationally anymore, but it's still something a lot of people do to survive. It's their means of business. And it was no different in Jesus' day. As we do this Stories of the Kingdom series, we're looking at everyday experiences that Jesus latched into and used to teach the kingdom of heaven, and fishing is no exception. Back then, they, did, they fished to survive. And we know this because at least four of Jesus' disciples, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, were all professional fishermen. And Jesus even invited them to follow him straight out of the boats. They were on the shore of the Sea of Galilee when Jesus invited them. In fact, famously, Jesus invites Peter and Andrew this way. This is from Matthew chapter 4. He said, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. The famous line, I will make you fishers of men. That you guys know how to fish for fish. I'm going to send you out and use those same skills and those same objectives to catch people now. 
And that's been preached about hundreds of thousands of times in Christian history. But as this verse actually raises an interesting question that I want to pose, and it's actually a question we can pose to every verse in the Bible. Is this text meant to be descriptive or prescriptive? Descriptive or prescriptive? Let me explain. So a descriptive text is a text that, in the scripture that tells us something about something that happened. It's, it can be educational and of value to us, but a descriptive text is not telling us to do anything ourselves. So like a, a good example would be Genesis chapter 1. God speaks the world into existence with his word in six days. And that happened, and we can glorify God that he created the world. But at no point are we being asked to speak creation ourselves. That's not our job. So it's a descriptive text because it's not asking anything of us. Now, alternatively, you have a prescriptive text. And a prescriptive text is a text that is telling us something that happened in Scripture, but by extension, it is telling us something too. It's giving us an instruction, an invitation. A good example of that would be the Great Commission in Matthew 28, when Jesus says, go and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We baptized this morning. Jesus is saying this to 11 disciples, go and baptize. But by extension, he's saying it to all of us too. So we baptized Blakely this morning. It's a prescriptive text. Now, this text from Matthew 4, is it descriptive or prescriptive? Because if it's descriptive, if Peter's, or Jesus is only talking to Peter and Andrew, it's only their job to go out and fish for people for the kingdom of God. Well, I mean, they died like 2,000 years ago. If this was descriptive, Christianity would have fizzled out 2,000 years ago. No, this is a prescriptive text. That is, Jesus is inviting Peter and Andrew to go fish for people, fish for men. We are being invited to do the same, to put our, put our lines into the water and see what we can catch. Now, nine chapters later in Matthew 13, Jesus comes back to the concept of fishing in one of his parables. And this is our kingdom parable for the day. It's the parable of the nets from Matthew 13, where Jesus says this. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. They sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but they threw the bad away. Is this a descriptive or a prescriptive text? Now, the parable of the nets in Matthew 13 is not the most common of parables that gets preached on. So perhaps you've never even heard this parable before. And even if you had, I'm guessing none of us have spent a lot of time debating whether it's a descriptive or prescriptive text, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suppose today and suggest today that we all treat this like a prescriptive text. Like this is a command for us to do something, the fishermen deciding which good fish are good, which fish are bad, and let me explain. See, in this series, we've been looking at parables, like I said. We started two weeks ago, Pastor Lee started two weeks ago with the parable of the banquet, the, the great banquet. That in that story, Jesus uses this story, this extended metaphor of a king setting up a banquet table. And he invites his buddies, and his buddies don't show up. So he sends his servants out, and he invites everybody they can find. The poor and the lame, people who you wouldn't think would deserve to go to a king's banquet are invited and there's more space, so they keep sending the servants back out to invite more and more. And Pastor Lee explained that this is, this, is the, this is a parable about salvation itself, that the king has prepared a table for us, this altar, a table in eternity, and that we are all the poor and the lame who don't deserve to come, but the, the king himself has invited us by Jesus' death on the cross has invited us to that banquet. The great banquet is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Christianity is found in the great banquet parable. Now, last week, Pastor Lee had this ear of corn. And Jesus uses this concept to keep talking about that great banquet, that gospel message. And he says, when you take that message out, the gospel, it's kind of like seed. And it's going to fall on potentially four, four different types of soil. Three of those soils are bad. It's a path, it's shallow, it's filled with weeds. It's a type of soil where a seed is not going to thrive. It's going to fail to produce, it's going to fail to grow. And there are people like that, that they're going to hear the gospel message and it's just not going to grow in their heart. But there's a fourth type of, of soil too. It's good soil. It's good soil that takes that seed and grows it into a beautiful big plant. 
that when we get one little seed of faith in our hearts, it grows into, what do you say, 720 seeds? It multiplies itself for the benefit of everyone around it, and that's, that's faith growing in good soil. So there's three types of bad soil and one type of good soil. And I think it's interesting because there's roughly 8 billion people on the planet, and there's roughly 2 billion Christians, a 3 to 1 ratio. Now, does that mean Jesus was telling us how many Christians there would be in the world? Or is it just coincidence? I don't know. But ultimately, we all know that the gospel message is going to fall on deaf ears. That there's going to be people that we say it to that just never hear it. And so we start going, well, who is this person? We have somebody walk up in front of us and we start deciding in advance. We're using the parable there as a prescriptive text well, are you a good fish or a bad fish? Should I waste my time telling you about Jesus because I know you're going to reject it? Or should I tell you? We start deciding in advance who's deserving of hearing the gospel message. A couple of years ago, back in Chicago, I was, a, I was a life group leader. It was one of the first main things I did in ministry. I was a life group leader, and I led a group of 20s and 30s, and we had gotten pretty big to the point where people would come up to me after church to introduce me to their friend or their whatever, and say, hey, this person would like to join your group. That's how we grew. And one Sunday, I had an older fella come up to me. I don't, I'd seen him before, I don't remember his name, but he, I'd seen him before, and he came up to me, and in tow with him is he, clearly his daughter. And all I can say is that his daughter looked rough. And her posture was terrible. And you could see it on her face. She did not want her dad to be doing this, to be talking to me. And her dad came up and said, this is my daughter, she's just got out of prison. And I'd like her to find a group, a group of people she can join in fellowship to show her love. And I looked at her as the leader of this group, and I looked at how disheveled she looked and how disinterested she looked, and I don't remember what I said to her, but what came out was, there's not really a place for you here. You're not going to find the community you're looking for here. That's what I said to her. See, this dad had put his line, his fishing line, into the water and hooked his own daughter, his beloved daughter, and he brought her to me, and I decided she wasn't worthy of the gospel message. And I sent her on her way. And I never saw her again. Come to think of it, I never saw him again either. I can only pray that God put somebody in her life that would show her love and acceptance and give her the gospel message and share this beauty we have in Jesus Christ because I didn't do it. I decided it was my place to be a fisherman who decided which fish were good and which fish were bad. Now, that's kind of an extreme story. But we all, like I said, I think we all do this. We do this in smaller ways. I had a lady come into my office a couple weeks ago. And um, I'm gonna, this is a true story, but I'm not going to use her name and I'm not going to use her company. But um, she goes here and she says a lot of her coworkers go here as well. And on Sunday mornings, they treat her so nicely. Then she said on Monday morning, they treat me nasty. And they treat everybody else they run into nasty. What's going on, Pastor? I thought about it. And I think it connects to this. It's really easy to catch Christians on Sunday morning, right? We're around friends. We're around people that we've spent our lives in ministry with. It's really easy to put our lines into the water here and be nice to each other. But out there, there's a bunch of perch out there. Undesirable perch. And I don't want to give you, those people my time. And so we start behaving differently in here. And out there, I can tell you a number of times somebody has swore in my presence as a pastor. They go, oh, I'm sorry, pastor. Do you swear out there? Do you apologize out there? Or do you just apologize in front of me? Are you given different bait? Does it look differently here and out there? We're treating people differently. You deserve it. You don't deserve it. You deserve the best. You don't deserve the best. We all treat this parable like it's our command to decide who's good fish and who's bad fish. But this parable, this parable of the nets from Matthew 13 is actually one of the few places where Jesus actually describes the parable's meaning to the people. So I want to read it to you again. This is Matthew 13, 47 again. Jesus says, once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. Then Jesus goes on to explain what it means. This is how it'll be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into a blazing furnace where there'll be a weeping and a gnashing of teeth. Jesus is saying that at the end of the age, at the end of time, on judgment day, 
there's going to be a dragnet. A dragnet that goes across the entire earth and every man, woman, and child that ever has existed, exists, or ever will exist will be caught in that dragnet and pulled ashore and we will all stand before God in judgment. And God has commanded his angel to weed out the, the, the bad fish, the, the people whose seed fell on poor soil. They were poor soil. And they'll be sent out to a real place called hell. And those who have received the gospel message, the good soil will be, will be caught up into the baskets for eternal glory to spend eternity with their Lord. Jesus is talking about the last day. This is a descriptive parable. But it invites us to realize something. That we all have the gospel message. We all are invited to put our lines into the water. As Jesus said to Peter and Andrew, I will make you fishers of men, not I will make you catchers of men or catchers of desirable Christians, but, catcher, but fishers. Put your line into the water. You never know what you're going to catch. That woman that I talked to, that I dis disregarded, would she have heard it if I had bothered to care for her enough to send, give her the gospel message? I don't know. But it's not my, discernment, my thing to decide if she would have heard. Jesus says, go fish, not go catch. Catching is his job. Fishing is our job, so to speak. I like how um, St. Paul says it. St. Paul says it the, the same thing in a different way. He doesn't use a fishing metaphor, but he says this famously in 1 Corinthians. It says it this. It says, to the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. To the weak, I became weak. To win the weak, I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means, I might save some. Paul realized that he had different audiences. Jews, Greeks, the weak. Whatever terminology he wanted to use, but he realized there were different people, but all were worthy of hearing the gospel message, and he knew only some would hear it. So he might save some. But that wasn't going to deter him from telling everybody, to putting his line into the water, to bait his hook, to see what he could catch. So what's your bait look like? What does your bait look like? That's my question for you today. Is your bait designed to catch good Christians and only good Christians and everybody else get something different? Or do we bait our hooks with the true bait, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ has died on the cross to forgive sinners that they might live for eternity with him? Because that's the truth of the matter. We're all perch. Every one of us is an undesirable perch. Every one of us has sin in our hearts that separates us from God. There's nothing desirable in me that makes me look like a bass to God, that God would want to mount it over his fireplace. I caught this one. We're all perch. We're all sinners, but Jesus Christ came into the world to redeem the perch and give them this message. You're still loved. I don't care what you look like. I've died for you. It's kind of like that picture of my son up there. He didn't care what he caught. He wanted to catch. And he was joyous when he caught it. I like my son as a metaphor for fishing today. What's your bait look like? Out in the point, as the, for those of you who came in, you saw a map out there. And if you haven't had a chance already, I'm going to invite you after the service to go out into the point and grab one of the little blue push pins and put the pin into the map where you live in the town and in the region. For those of you joining us, I've lost my cameras. Which one's on? Anyway, here's the little red light back there. There you are. Hi. If you're joining us at a distance, obviously you're not here to put a pin in today, but this is what the map looks like out in the point. I'm going to invite you to either text, um, text your address to 402-371-9005, that's our church office number, or email, or if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, you can put it in the comment section so that we'll see it and we can put a pin into this map for you because the cool thing's going to happen is you're all going to come back next week. And you're going to look at this map once again, and we're going to leave this up all summer, and this map is going to be covered with little blue pins. We're going to realize that God has cast us out like a net across this community, across Norfolk, across Northeast Nebraska, across the world. We got a pin in there from San Diego already. Somebody here's from San Diego, welcome. We're going to realize God has cast us out like a net across this community with bait of the gospel of Jesus Christ to reach our community with the gospel. Something we said a couple weeks ago. 
we announced a couple weeks ago, this fall, right after Labor Day, we're planning on organizing a bunch of community barbecues. That we're going to take the 10 people, can I put that map up again a second? That we're going to take the 10 people that live in this area, the 10 people that live in this area, and we're going to invite you to invite your neighbors to a barbecue. We're, going to, we're still working on the logistics, but we're going to help you pull off a barbecue and invite your neighbors. And you're going to invite some, and you're going to realize you invited the person that goes to Christ Lutheran, the person that goes to Sacred Heart Catholic or First Christian out on the other side of town, and you will have caught a good Christian. Good for you. Fellowship with them. Enjoy the salvation together you have in Jesus Christ. But you're also going to catch up in that net the atheist who doesn't think anybody in this world cares about them anymore. You're going to catch the single mom who's too shamed about her, her scenario to talk to anybody. And those people are going to hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ, maybe for the first time. Stay tuned for more information on that barbecue, because this is going to be a major thing we do this fall to invite the community into fellowship with us. So they might hear the gospel message. But like I said, if you're in person, stop by out there, grab one of those pins, stick it in. One little aside, for, just for the sake of you know, giving them credit, we discovered that the white pins I bought didn't show up on the map. So my children and I, those pictures there, we painted 500 pins blue last night. <laughs> so please put a pin in. <laughs> but think about your bait. That this is a bait. God has placed you somewhere on purpose. I think it's interesting though, is my last, last point here. At Easter, we had 2,500 people here at the church. It's the most we've ever had. 2,500 people came to here on Easter Sunday. But that's 10% of Norfolk. It's 2,500. 10% only. Now, some of those people, of course, went to other churches, obviously, a lot of churches in town. But it wasn't 100%. And until 100% of Norfolk, of Northeast Nebraska, of the United States, of the world, has heard the gospel message of Jesus Christ, we have work to do. We have been invited to be fishers of men, to put our lines in the water, to bait our hooks with the gospel of Jesus Christ so that they too could spend eternity with us. Amen? Amen. Now may the peace of God, which transcends your hearts and minds, keep yourselves in Christ Jesus until the day he returns. Amen. I invite you to stand. And let's pray. Lord God, as we go out into this world, we go out from this place, invite us to see where you've placed us, where the net has been cast in our lives, that we would see, we see the good work that's in front of us, that we would be able the opportunity to share this gospel message with everyone we encounter. We leave the decision of who's going to believe and who doesn't to you. Lord God, we ask that you would encourage us by the power of your Holy Spirit to care for everyone in our paths. In the name of your son, Jesus, amen.